When you feel stressed, what is the first thing you do? According to my guest today, your answer could be to breathe well on purpose. This is the 5 a.m. Miracle, episode number 381. Breath work, meditation, Wim Hof, and cold therapy with Robbie Bent. Good morning, I am Jeff Sanders, and this is the podcast dedicated to dominating your day before breakfast. My guest today is the CEO and co-founder of Inward, a company in the mental health space combining physical spaces like ice baths and saunas and the largest library of breathwork content in the world. And now here is my interview with Robbie Bent. So I want to dig today right into the topic of breathing. This is a topic that I have uh, toyed back and forth for the last couple of years in terms of meditation practices or just I mean, Wim Hof style breathing. I know it's really popular now. So let's just go with kind of your story of when you discovered, I guess, the power of breath work or the, the value of breathing in certain ways. Uh, what, what's your story around, around breath work? Amazing. And so I started my mental health journey with meditation. Uh, using meditation to conquer some addiction issues. And that started with a 10-day Vipassana retreat. And that was the first time I really felt connected to, to self-awareness and really felt, hey, there's something here with meditation. Prior to that, I'd been doing using Headspace for sort of two to three years, kind of 10 minutes a day. And, you know, I would do it some days, miss some days, and kind of feel guilty that I missed it. And thought like, hey, this is useful. But it was only after a 10-day meditation retreat that I really really felt what is actually available uh, with these type of techniques and why they're important. After the meditation uh, experience, I tried for four years to get friends to also do it. So in our meetings, we would host, you know, meditation minutes before the meeting started. Uh, I would try to get everybody on our team to meditate. And out of, you know, 200, 300 friends that I had told about this amazing 10-day retreat and meditation, I would say, you know, around 20 maybe picked it up. And it was awesome for those 20, but for the other 90% of people, it's just really difficult, not accessible. And I think it comes down to you start to meditate and you immediately start to notice your thoughts and being with your thoughts when you're overstimulated is pretty uncomfortable. And then the onboarding can take quite a long time. So it's, it's very much like learning a new sport or a new skill. And for the first three months, you don't really know what you're doing. You're not necessarily feeling the benefits. It's just kind of like, am I even doing this correctly? And for most people, it feels strange and awkward. And so I just have seen my friends that are super busy, overwhelmed, always stimulated with Slack and WhatsApp and emails and social media. They just are like, yeah, it's cool. It's a cool thing, but I don't have time. And so I was thinking about that for a long time as I was meditating. How can I get more people into this stuff? And I'd heard about Wim Hof. Uh, I also have a space around saunas and ice baths. So I'm absolutely obsessed with the ice bath. And I went to a Wim Hof um, ceremony or in Toronto, uh, like a four hour breathwork and ice bath session and getting in that ice bath for the first time, feeling the neuropinephrine in the brain, tripling the neurotransmitter for attention, mood, vigilance. It was a natural meditative state. After that, we then did the breathwork and it blew my mind because in one session you can change the blood oxygen and CO2 ratios. And as a result, which I can get into later, you're shutting down the blood flow to the brain over time, and you're shutting down the neocortex, the ego, the part of your mind that's always thinking. So again, through this, I think let's call it more accessible route, you're getting into that meditative state also. And then I proceeded to do Wim Hof every day on YouTube, uh, a YouTube video he did with Lewis House. Um, you know, no music in the background, just this random video. And every morning I did it. And then that led me to doing the Wim Hof training and just loved that style of breath work and started experimenting with it with friends. And so when COVID hit this year, we had to shut down our physical business and I felt really bad. I noticed a lot of people stressed out. So we started doing breath work sessions online every Sunday on Zoom. And, you know, first it gets 10 people, then 20 people, then 50 people, then 100, then 200. We're kind of like, what's going on here? Like, people are, are loving this. And they're asking for recordings. So we start putting the recordings on Zoom. Then people are asking, hey, can you do a breath work for sleep? And so I started to think like, hey, there's something really interesting here. And so I do a ton of research. So I've tried holotropic, buteco. I've read, you know, every research paper on 
breath work and like different styles and pranayama and, you know, James Nestor's recent book, Gittin Tonkov's book, uh, Patrick McKeon's Oxygen Advantage book. And I do a course with Patrick McKeon and just find that not only are there, you know, the sympathetic style dominant breathing, which is really turning on the nervous system, but people are overstimulated. 90% of people are over breathing, which we can talk about why that's the case. But I kind of find that it's not just these like really powerful Zoom sessions. It's it's fixing foundational breathing. And when I looked into breath work, I kind of found, you know, the more deep psychedelic-like breathing, the holotropics, the Wim Hofs on one end, generally more expensive, required about an hour of time. Oftentimes you need a personal facilitator. And on the other side was the athletic style, oxygen advantage uh, XPT, Laird Hamilton stuff, which is awesome as well, but sort of targeted at fitness and athletes. And I saw a big gap in the market for sort of that, like, you know, $10, $15 a month headspace like product where you had all the breathing styles. And it was really hit home to me when I read the book by James Nestor, Breath, amazing, amazing book. And all the examples he had shown were links to just random YouTube videos. And so there was no structured programs, uh, easy access videos. And I just thought, oh, we should create you know, an amazing uh, website with just access to hundreds of videos and structured programs for, you know, sleep, morning routine, wind down, anxiety, emotional release. And so the idea was to combine all of the best breathwork techniques with really, really great music. And one thing about our site in my breathwork journey, it's like, how do you get people who haven't gotten into mindfulness yet? How do you make it fun, exciting? Like I'm going to you know, a Burning Man or a festival and have that, or like a spin class and have that kind of vibe for mental health. So everything we've kind of tailored is, is hey, this is your first step and it's going to be fun, but also powerful. So that's sort of a bit about my, my background in, in breath and how we've led to building out our platform. I mean, it sounds like you described a variety of, of I guess, breath work strategies or methodologies here. What do you think is like the real goal behind this like intentional breathing, let's say? Because it sounds as though there are a variety of angles to hit, but it's as if we're breathing incorrectly and we need to change what we're doing or have a, do, a, a new approach to figure out how to connect to our breath. Like, what would you say is kind of the, the underlying foundation of what you're trying to achieve here with, with breathing like this? So there's a number of different benefits, which I'll go into sort of one by one, and feel free to, to interrupt and ask if you want to go deeper. But breath is doing one of two things. You're either turning on the gas pedal, the sympathetic nervous system, through rapid breathing, or you're turning on the parasympathetic nervous system, the rest and digest part of the nervous system. So you're tensing or releasing. And through breath, you can actually control the autonomic nervous system. So heart rate, digestion, blood flow, circulation, uh, immune system. Uh, so really all techniques kind of boil down to one of those two things. Now, foundational breathing has changed quite a bit over the last, you know, let's say 50 years. People are eating more acidic forming foods, soft foods. And at the same time, they are more stimulated than ever. So you're on your computer, you get an email, you look at it, you have an emotional response. Your brain doesn't know that this isn't real stress. It thinks it's perceived stress. And immediately, it's called the email apnea. You start breathing from the chest. You create a sympathetic response, turn on the fight or flight, and you're pushing your, your nervous system. And that's okay in small bursts. But when done chronically, you're cutting off the blood flow to the organs. Eight of the top 10 most common cancers come as a result of lack of blood flow to the organs. So your body's not meant to be in chronic stress all the time. The other interesting thing that happens when you're continuing to breathe from the chest, you have what's called a CO2 tolerance. This is a receptor in your brain that measures how much carbon dioxide is in the body. And when you're over breathing, either via eating acidic forming foods where you breathe out uh, carbon dioxide to change the pH level in the blood, or you're overstressed. And what happens is that CO2 tolerance decreases. Now, that's important because when you breathe in oxygen into the lungs, it's picked up by the hemoglobin in the blood and taken to the organs, the brain, the heart, the digestive system. And if you don't have enough CO2 in the body, the blood holds on to that oxygen and won't let it go. So what's happening to 90% of us that are overstressed, not eating properly, eating like directly before bed, which will increase over breathing before sleep, which is why you may have heard of this mouth tape. 
you're reducing your CO2 tolerance and as a result, not getting enough oxygen to the organs. So that's like foundational breathing. And you can fix that by mouth taping, by doing breath holds, by slowing the breath, creating an, an air hunger and doing exercises to do that for, you know, sort of 20 minutes a day. There's amazing tools, one by Anders Olsen called a relaxator. It's just a plastic soother you put in your mouth while you're working and it maintains healthy breathing habits to avoid this email apnea. So that's sort of the first thing to think about is, hey, what's my CO2 tolerance? What is my foundational breathing? And if you're doing the Wim Hof method and you're having trouble with those holds, it's a good sign your foundational breathing is, is likely off. Your CO2 tolerance is too low. How you actually do this exercise, you take a big breath in. When you wake up, you exhale and you hold your breath and you count. So it's very simple. You can do the exercise with a timer. You don't need any equipment. And if your CO2 tolerance, if it's 20 seconds or lower, that signifies you really need to work on your breath for, you know, to improve your performance, sleep, anxiety. Now, you're not trying to hold as long as you can. You're holding until the diaphragm sort of spasms. And so that's a good sign that like, hey, I, I've hit my max. Uh, 20 is sort of like the baseline of, hey, I'm doing okay. 40 is like elite. I'm doing excellent. It's really interesting too, because a lot of athletes that you think would have amazing breathing actually have poor breathing because they're going through so much exertion when exercising, they're breathing out too much carbon dioxide uh, regularly. So it's like a really interesting one of like, how do I breathe through my nose when I exercise and train my body to do that? So that's kind of the, the foundational, like the first step is like, am I breathing correctly? Then there's breathing to reduce stress, to get into a parasympathetic state, a state of focus. And so this is breathing deep into the lungs, turning on the parasympathetic nerves, which are in the bottom of the lungs, and slowing the exhale. And this can be used uh, before bed to help your nervous system relax. It can be used before meals to prepare your body for safety, for this rest and digest. Uh, so it, it's really well used when you want to like turn down and really, if you're tracking HRV and heart rate variability, if your guests are familiar with that, something, a main metric on the aura ring, when you get into fight or flight state, your heart rate increases. If you can use breath to bring it back down quickly, it's going to improve your HRV, your body's resilience to stress. So that's a really interesting technique that you can use before sleep, when you're facing like extenuating stress or uh, prior to a meal. And then the final one, which is pretty interesting, is called sympathetic breathing. And so this is holotropic breath work you may have heard of, which is a kind of used to get you into an altered state of mind and process emotion. Wim Hof is a sympathetic style where you're super ventilating. So you're breathing so much carbon dioxide out that over time, the arteries, the blood vessels constrict and you reduce the blood flow to the brain. Uh, because of this thing called the Bohr effect, which I mentioned before, when you don't have enough CO2, the blood holds on to the oxygen. And so you're reducing the oxygen levels in the brain. And as a result, the neocortex, the part of you that has your identity, that's thinking, that's ruminating all the time, it shuts down. And so you often see in holotropic breathing or Wim Hof style breathing, this distance and ability to then process emotions. And so that style of breathing can be used... Uh, one, it can, in, in shorter Wim Hof bursts, like 10 minutes, it can be used to boost uh, your adrenal response. And like, it's a really like a coffee substitute in the morning. But if you go deeper doing five, six rounds, you're shutting that blood flow down and you can create a real emotional regulation. You're turning on the autonomic nervous system, this fight or flight, and then you're allowing your body to release any stored trauma. And that's why in these holotropic breathwork sessions, transformation breathwork sessions, Wim Hof, you have crazy emotional releases uh, of stored traumas. So I would say those are three really interesting reasons and ways you can use breathwork. So one is your foundational breathing. One is parasympathetic breathing to teach your body to relax. And then the third is consciously stressing the body to shut down the brain to process emotions. This sounds like a, like a workout regimen almost, like as if instead of going to the gym, you might just go sit into a quiet space and breathe on purpose, which is interesting because it sounds like this is a like a lifestyle of like relearning how to breathe. 
is that basically what this is, this is or is it more of a like we're just trying to like a, a, attenuate certain like problems we have with our, with our health and trying to like dial in certain issues or is this more like a way of of living long term that that's like a, a better way of living I think it's a way of living long term so very much how you think about the pillars of health right now you know 10 years ago it was diet and exercise and if it was hey i exercise daily and i eat healthy i'm healthy in the last 3 years it's become very clear it's diet exercise and sleep and so if i'm not getting you know consistent 8 hour sleep it's going to impact my willpower my health my insulin levels my ability to exercise and so there's a lot of science around that i think the fourth pillar is breath so if i'm not breathing correctly it's going to impact my sleep my willpower, my anxiety levels, my resilience, my HRV, which is is the biggest one to me. It's this measure of my body's response to stress. If my breathing patterns are poor, it's likely my heart rate variability is also poor. So I would look at it if I'm if I'm thinking like how do I build a breathing routine? I would first say what is my CO2 tolerance and can I improve my foundational breathing? And then I would be looking at where I can add breathing to relax when I'm in a stress state or before bed. And then finally, I would look at these Wim Hof and like, let's call those the big guns, the breath plus. I would look at using those when I'm having emotional issues that I need to resolve. And so just like meditation, you can pick and choose. Like how long do I want to breathe for? What is the style that I want to use? What is the goal I'm trying to have? And you can choose based on what you you need. So you mentioned Wim Hof frequently here, and one thing that I know that he is really into, because I bought his course a few years ago, but have never actually finished it, which is kind of a mistake on my part. But one thing that I know he's really into, you mentioned ice baths and this idea of cold therapy. How does that integrate with breathing? Because you mentioned this idea that when you got into an ice bath, you kind of hit the state of meditation. I feel like there's a strong correlation here that I want to make sure we discuss, because there's so much to be said about being cold that people, are, I think, are afraid to do. So how does this play into it yeah so the ice bath for me was really the eye-opener of getting people into a more mindful state and so when you touch the cold water your brain produces norepinephrine so it's a neurotransmitter responsible for mood attention vigilance your brain is saying hey this could be dangerous i need to be aware and as a result the mind goes quiet right? If you're, you're in this physiologically meditative state, your emotions, your to-do list, your tasks, they fade. I had people come through our space that, you know, are 50 years old with ADHD and never been able to quiet their mind their entire life. And I said, hey, this was the first time I felt what it's like to be present, which is just so powerful. And so there's a couple of things you're, you're training yourself to do when you're in the cold. So when you get into the cold, just like I mentioned, it's, a, it's stimulating. And so it's turning on the sympathetic nervous system. So your body immediately wants to hyperventilate. So for your guests that know when you get in that ice bath, the first thing that happens, <gasps> right? And, and you're saying like, hey, I, I'm stressed. And what you're teaching yourself to do, that parasympathetic breathing style I had mentioned before. So, you know, even if you're listening now, just take a deep inhale, expand the belly, breathing deep into the diaphragm, nice, slow exhale. That's that parasympathetic response you're triggering, and you're training your body to do that in the face of stress. So when you go in the ice, it usually takes 30 seconds to a minute to master the breath and master surrender. And what you're training yourself is like any time a stressful situation comes up, I can breathe my way out of it, which is why the cold is so powerful for resilience, right? Because when anger comes up, anxiety comes up, you know, maybe you're reaction that you normally do is to yell or to get afraid and cower. And instead, you start to realize, hey, this is just a physical response from my body. And I can actually slow my breathing and breathe through it. And so combining that parasympathetic breath with the ice bath is a fantastic way to build your stress resilience. Yeah, it seems really powerful to be able to say that you could use breathing to reduce stress. I mean, one thing I'm thinking of here might be, you know, stage fright or panic attacks or those moments in life you have to do something that freaks you out. You have a, a, a tool in your toolkit, essentially, to say that I can train myself for those moments, which I think that it seems really undervalued to breathe correctly to prepare yourself for that. Like, how do you have 
I guess, certain daily habits or meditations or ways of, of practicing this? Is this like an intentional thing to say, I'm going to prepare myself for stress because I know that's an issue for me? Or do you focus mostly on other other practices for that? I guess what's kind of the, the go-to you think for someone who, who wants to, to de-stress and, and have a, a habit for that? So super easy, easiest one that I found works pretty awesome is mouth taping at night. There's tons. If you type in mouth taping on Google, there's lots of different brands. Uh, it's just covering the mouth so you're not mouth breathing. And so you think you're asleep for eight hours. That's one of the biggest impacts you can have on breath. And what that's doing is improving that CO2 tolerance. So I'm just less likely to be stressed. The next thing to do is track your heart rate variability. There's a number of studies around HRV indicating when your HRV is higher, you're much likely to have more positive emotions. So a couple of things you can do for that. Cold water exposure is great for HRV, sunlight, sleeping at the same time each night. Uh, you can use something like an HR. Um, an aura ring or a polar chest strap to sort of, or a daily elite uh, HRV app to be tracking your, your HRV. There's an amazing, amazing book called Breath, Heart, Mind by Dr. Leo Lagos with some practices. One of the really cool things she does uh, that I learned from her book was to really feel into a positive situation before it happens using breath. So an example of that might be Hey, I'm going to breathe. Okay, so let's take the example you meant like public speaking or giving a presentation. So you're nervous. And so what you would want to do in that case is think about a time you felt really brave or what it's going to feel like when you crush that presentation. So a time when you've, you know, crushed the presentation before and you're going to breathe in for 20 minutes. You know, if you have time, 10 is fine also. But on the inhale, focusing on the breath, feeling in your body what it feels like you know, the time you went to your boss and asked for a raise or the time you really uh, did super well on something and were brave and you connect to that feeling. And then on the exhale, you just let the muscles go and feel the relaxation. And so you're attuning your breath to these feelings. And as a result, you're telling your subconscious mind these feelings are important and it becomes easier to generate them on command. And this actually increases your, your heart rate variability crazy studies that gratitude and just feelings of happiness and like consciously doing them, even if you're sitting there thinking, okay, what am I grateful for today? That has a massive impact on your body's ability to deal with stress. And and this is sort of like new science that's coming out. That's just uh, extremely interesting. Yeah, it it is really powerful to think that you can do this, I guess, so simplistically. Um, I, I, one of the things I I did before we did the interview was I took one of the, the breath work classes that you have. Um, I noticed that one of the things that I I noticed right away was there was background music with a beat going. It's like breathe on the beat and then breathe out and like this, like really guided experience through it, which I think that one thing I have had, I guess, difficulty with myself over years is that I don't know kind of what to do in these scenarios. So do you think that there is or what's the value in having like a guided practice or a place to go or a, a, a course to take or things along those lines? Like, is that is that the best way for someone to enter into this space to like learn more about it and like have that guided aspect? Or what do you think is the best way to like begin that kind of day one? I want to to breathe more properly. What do I do? Yeah, so there's obviously amazing books on the subject if you're super interested in the science of how things work. So I always like to ask somebody, what is your why? And understand that. And that's going to help how I guide them. And so if the why is like, look, I really want to improve my sleep. I want to know the science behind sleep and everything about it. Then that's a person who a book is going to be helpful to understand the physiology. So we try to carve out a lot of Uh, scientific details on the site. We've kind of stayed away from discussion around spirituality and meditation, understanding that that already exists for many people. We're just saying like, hey, this is your first step. And you mentioned the music. We take pride in, you know, selecting and curating really, really good, fun music. And so my goal is that somebody will start a new habit if the habit at first they can feel it and it's fun. And so using like this amazing music and this amazing guidance, it makes it dead easy where you feel like, okay, I just went to a spin class. I know what I'm doing. I think a lot of people without guidance, it's like, well, you know, or if the thing is boring initially, there becomes just a lot of friction to, to build a new habit because it's really hard. So what we're trying to do with our site is build structured programs. So you can say, you know what, I want to just commit for 14 days 
to reduce my anxiety in less than 20 minutes. And you can pick a program. It's like one new session for you every day to work on anxiety. Or, you know, you can say, hey, I want 30 days to improve sleep. So a couple of things we like to do that are a bit different is like a structured program, day in, day out, combination with really good music and guidance and this bright breathing in the back so you know you're doing it right and it also is fun. And then including the scientific background, like some of the things I mentioned about CO2 tolerance and sympathetic versus parasympathetic and what's happening in the body and brain. So, you know, you kind of understand your why and what's happening. Yeah, I think the idea of the why is so critical. There's so many of these, you know, health practices that we could choose from in a given day. I think it's interesting that there's so much power in the breath work. I mean, you mentioned uh, the book with James Nestor and and mouth taping, and I've been doing that for the last six months or so because of his book. And I can say that even that simple practice is is profound. It's it's really interesting how those tiny little choices that we make have an impact over time. I think that if you can zero in on like what you're trying to do, like even me personally doing that little bit. I feel that benefit. I'm curious as to, you know, the potential then if you really dig into the stuff hardcore, where you can see yourself down the line. You had a story on that. I mean, for me, you know, I wasn't healthy and it, you know, you can do these things slowly and find the ones that, you know, even if it's a cold shower for 10 seconds, but you're going to do it every day and you're going to start associating the cold shower, the mouth tape with feeling good. I think that's the most important part in a hobby is like a feedback loop and a habit is a, is a feedback loop. So you start doing it, you know, a few days later, you feel awesome. You understand this is why you're feeling awesome. And then it becomes part of your lifestyle. But for those out there who are like, oh, I, you know, I could never do this. I don't know where to start. I spent 10 years with uh, alcohol and, uh, you know, drug addiction problems. And I, I just wasn't healthy. And it started with meditation and psychedelic medicines. And then those were kind of like the big the big daddy for, for changing. And then it's all about the daily habits. And through those, you know, I learned about daily meditation and breath work and ice baths and then healthy diet. And then how could I improve sleep? But it's not something I'm beating myself up about. I kind of, if I find a habit, I like it, I try it. You know, if I, if I can't do it for a couple of days, that's okay too. I think it's just about realizing that whatever you try, it's okay. All these things are available for you and not getting super, you know, um, judgmental with yourself. Like I have a lot of friends and I've been in places myself where it was like, Oh, I have to do my four hour morning routine or <laughs> my day's room. And, and it's kind of just, I think at the end of the day, after 10 years of all of this stuff and practices, it's like being kind to yourself is almost the number one. Yeah, that, that's very true. I mean, I, I was that guy who did a lot of, you know, four and five and six hour morning routines. I, I know that experience and it's uh they're fun things to do, but you don't have time to do everything, which I think is an interesting kind of choice. So one thing you just mentioned just now is psychedelic medicines. And this is one topic that I have not covered at great length in this podcast, but I would love to hear kind of your experience there. You mentioned that that was kind of one of your big daddy things to do in the beginning. Like, can you share at least uh, briefly, like, part, like how was that influential for you? What did you lean on? What do you think is the benefit for the average person? Kind of just give us a, you know, a, a quick summary of a, a lengthy topic there. A hundred percent. And so in the show notes or, you know, for your listeners, a, a really nice intro resource that people always reference is how to change your mind by Michael Pollan. And that's just kind of the why the research in the past, what you might use these for, Another one is called Consciousness Medicine by Francois Borslat, and that's the how. So if you're preparing for a psychedelic medicine experience and you're interested, it's kind of like how you can, can do it. Now, for me personally, I was saying I struggled with drug and alcohol addiction, uh, you know, probably for, for 10 years or so on and off. And I went into the Vipassana retreat. I had some profound changes to my lifestyle, but still had this urge uh, to go out socially and drink and which would always end in, in tears. And I had heard about psychedelic medicines at the Vipassana retreat and uh, did a ton of research on ayahuasca, flew down to Peru, spent, uh, you know, a week at an amazing space in Iquitos in the jungle, uh, doing my first four ayahuasca ceremonies. Uh, since then I've done 10 and since then I've actually been sober and what they were really helpful with just in a very confronting and challenging ways, shutting down the, the default mode, 
network or the executive function of the brain. And, and you can do this also in a, in a sort of light way using deeper breathwork techniques. When you're shutting down that part of the brain, you're able to process stored trauma. And what I mean by stored trauma, it's not like, hey, I, I was in a car accident or I was assaulted. It could be, you know, I was 10 years old. I went to give my first speech and somebody called me fat. Or I like this girl and I approached her to ask her out. And she called me a loser. And, you know, I was, wasn't comfortable approaching a girl ever again. And so that stored trauma uh, is a result of rejection, failure, and your body's response. And so if you're resonating with this now, I mean, this everybody has this. And it's when we get into that fight or flight and we don't process the energies because those emotions were too painful at the time. And then that has a big impact on us throughout life. So, you know, maybe this girl called me a loser and I don't feel comfortable uh, with females like ever since. And it's kind of, that's how I react now. I feel like nervous around them, right? And so psychedelic medicines shut down this like thinking, ruminating, executive, like sometimes it's called the secondary consciousness and allows the body to process these stored emotions. And you come out on the other side a lot of times with, with breakthroughs, uh, especially like dealing with challenging moments that happened to you as a child. And so for me, I went back and remembered a time I was, was bullied. And, you know, I went, and my mom brought me to a friend's house and I hadn't remembered this memory for like 30 years. And it was some, you know, we were maybe five years old and the kid would pin me down and like punch me. And I was so afraid. And I think that led to a lot of fear throughout my entire life. And so I kind of remembered that feeling it came up i processed it uh, another one was like why was i even using these substances in the first place and it was you know in grade eight i was 14 i remember smoking my first cigarette and there was a group of kids smoking and i thought oh that's cool like i'm gonna prove to them i'm cool and you know i, I saw that time in the ayahuasca and it was like why am i still doing this this isn't cool you know i'm like 30 it wasn't quite 30 yet and just like I don't, I don't need to do this anymore. And so one, it allows you to confront challenging emotions, which is extremely powerful and let them go. You then feel, honestly, you feel like you've shed like massive layers of emotional baggage. You feel a hundred pounds lighter and just more optimistic. Your heart is open. It's ready to love. And it also provides changes in your, your neurotransmitter dopamine responses. So making a new habit is much easier. So if you're going to try to quit smoking or, you know, some other type of addictions or just when I want to like build a new habit, I'll often use a psychedelic medicine experience. I'll set my intention. I'll tell my subconscious mind beforehand what I want to do, how I want to feel. And then I'll use the psychedelic medicine to sort of cement that. And I find, you know, there's this guy, Mendel Kalin, who gives an amazing example where your brain, the thought patterns are so wired, especially as you get older, it's like you're in a, on a, a hill and you're skiing and it's the same tracks getting deeper and deeper and the same thoughts when you wake up, you know, oh, I got to go to work. What about my kids? What about my financial security? And when you take the psychedelic medicines, it's like a fresh blizzard comes and you can take different paths and have different thoughts. And so I look at it as just a catalyst for change. So those two things for me have been incredibly powerful. I'm still using the medicines every, you know, six months or so. Uh, I've tried most of them now at this point over the last six, seven years. And um, I just find them super powerful if I need a reset, if I want to change a habit, if I want to deal with like a stuck emotion. Uh, fantastic for all of those things. Yeah, that's powerful. There's a lot to be said about yeah, what uh, what you experienced there. I think a lot of people have also experienced having the, I think, shedding emotional trauma and just being able to have a, a, a tool that allows it to be possible I think there's there's so much to be said about personal growth and emotional health and mental health that that comes from that. I think it's really interesting that, that yeah that, that works so well for you and you're still still doing it. Um, is there anything else that we didn't touch on today that you want to be sure our listeners hear about? Because I feel like there's there's a lot here you could dig into, and I want to make sure they get to, as much as they can. Totally, I guess the the final thing you know I think to remember when you're getting caught up in a productive life is to be kind to yourself. And we mentioned that a bit, but one way to do that is to have strong community. And so it's to find friends who have the same values as you. And I think there's enough of these sub communities now, people interested in biohacking and entrepreneurship in psychedelic medicines and meditation, that these things are no longer weird. It's very common to want to go out and maybe share your emotions about like, how do I better myself and my community? And so for people listening, 
trying to find your community locally is one of the most powerful levers because it gives you a chance to be vulnerable with others that share your goals and to have people hold you accountable. And so we're building in Toronto now a social space around saunas and ice baths. So like 40 person sauna with crazy music, amazing ice baths with guided sessions where you might share gratitude in the sauna or tell each other what you're letting go of with the sauna in the dark and a drum and like amazing music and designed with an aesthetic that feels like you're at Soho House or a beautiful restaurant. So it doesn't feel like you have to go to a doctor's office uh, to kind of like share, you know, it doesn't have to feel like there's something wrong with you to want to connect with others. And so my, you know, final thing to share is just finding these community spaces that are healthy uh, and a community that's going to support you for me is, is like the number one goal I want to enable for people. And I want to build spaces that they can go to, to find this. Yeah, that's great stuff. I totally agree. I think the community aspect there is, is enormously powerful. Uh, where can our listeners go to learn more from you and, and to dig into the work you're doing now? Yeah, so in the show notes, we'd love to give a link uh, for a discount uh, specifically for your community to our platform, but www.inwardbreathwork.com or at Inward Breathwork on Instagram to find out and test the Breathwork platform I mentioned. Uh, or they can find me at Robbie Bent one on Twitter, where I talk about a lot of these things and I give updates on our, our physical space and its progress. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I'll make sure to have those links for our listeners this week. But uh, Robbie, this has been great. I think there's a lot, a lot more to dig into with these topics. And I love that, that you had so much success with these things. I'm really happy you got to share that with our listeners today. And yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks, Jeff. Appreciate you having me, man. That was awesome. Really had a lot of fun. And for that great action step this week, check out Robbie's Inward Breathwork program. You know, building the habit of breathing well every day can add up to enormous change over time. The breathing techniques from Robbie and his team have a lot to offer, and you can find a wide variety of ways to breathe better and radically improve your health and reduce your stress. Go to jeffsanders.com slash 381 for the show notes page this week for all the links discussed on the episode this week. And that's all I've got for you here on the 5 a.m. Miracle Podcast. Until next time, you have the power to change your life. And the fun begins bright and early. 